Hello and welcome to Brokenomics. Now, in last week's episode, Dr. Steve Turley left us with um, a, a really impactful thought. I, when I asked him, what do we need to be focusing our energies on? He said we need to be rebuilding culture, family and faith. Now, I, I'm a bit so-so on, on the faith. I'm not as good as I could be on the faith thing. So I had to think, who do I know who's quite good on the faith stuff? And I thought of Calvin Robinson. <laughs> I like to hear that I'm quite good on the faith stuff. Thank, thank you for that. <laughs> well, I mean, you, you, you seem qualified. I mean, you've got, the, yeah. you've got the uniform and everything. So just about getting there. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so Calvin, thank, thank you so much for coming on. Not at all. It's a pleasure. Yes. Now, I, I, I would love to ask you about um, the decline of the church yeah. in England. But before I do, I kind of have to ask you about the thing of the moment, which okay. is which is the Daily Wire versus Candice Owens. Oh, yeah. What, what's your take on that, then? Okay, my take is, I mean, first of all, there's a lot of office politics going on and airing dirty laundry. I hate that. I hate office politics and I hate airing dirty laundry. There's a lot of that. Uh, it seems to me that Candice did want a debate, but the Daily Wire lot were being a bit uh, sly yes. about knowing when she was out of the country and then filing a... Um, in order to silence her and all the... Just don't be underhanded. Just have a debate, one-on-one. -on -one. Just get Ben Shapiro and Candace Owens up. But everyone would love that. That would be amazing for their ratings. Anyway, uh, the, the question itself, though, is on whether Christ is king. Yes. Christ is king. We should always say that. Loudly, proudly, proclaim it from the rooftops. Christ is king. And if anyone tries to gaslight us in saying, oh, that's anti-Semitic, or that's Islamophobic, or that's racist, or that's this, or that, or the other, no, Christ is king. Mm. Because other faiths are permitted this sort of um, muscular um, ideology or theology, but, but Christians for some reason don't seem to be allowed to be quite as strident and muscular about their faith as everyone else is. Yes, it's expected that we'll be uh, milk mm. warm, kind of uh, milk toast, lukewarm, sorry. It's kind of that mild and nice, you know, winsomeness. And yes. There's nothing in the Christian faith that says you have to be a wet. You can be no. a, a lion for the faith. In fact, you're well, told I mean, Christians to do have a bit of history when it comes to being a bit forthright, but it was, it was a while right. ago. Right, yeah. And I think there's a lot of modernity in the faith at the moment, unfortunately, yes. or in the church, not in the faith, the faith that is uh, immutable. But the church has taken on board a lot of modernity that means that we have to be liberal progressives and we have to be uh, mm. accepted and acceptable by moderate society. And that means that we water everything down and or don't speak about things that are important. And so people think that Christianity has become, you know, well, don't judge and love everyone. And actually, neither of those things is true. Like, well, now is the time for a bit of judgment, I think. Well, Christians are taught to judge righteously. Yes. So that people often take that one line of scripture that says, thou shalt not judge, but they don't take the whole sentence, never mind the whole verse or the whole chapter. It, the Christ is teaching us to judge righteously. And, and even on the issue of love, yes, we're told to love everyone, told to love our neighbours, but that doesn't mean affirming, that doesn't mean embracing sin. That means if you love someone, you guide them away from sin into Christ, into God's order. And that is quite often the opposite of what the rest of the world would like us to do. Yes. Well, you know, I suppose that is the that is the key role of the of, of of the priest, isn't it? It is to put these things in context and explain their true meaning. Because if you are not in that, you only hear the cliched bit, which is you know the the don't judge or the, yeah, love, the love, love bit. You, you you don't hear it in its context, which is which is the role that has been removed. So let's get on to that. Let's talk about the decline of the church in England. Because I mean, interrupt me wherever you want, but. Obviously, the high point of the church in this country probably would have been when it's at a key part of the power structure. So, you know, the Middle Ages, um, communities would have been built around their church and church attendance would have been almost universal. Now, that decline, they came out of the power structure um, with the sort of the, the change to the towns. And I've talked about that a lot in Brokenomics. But even by, say, the Victorian era, church attendance was well over 50%. Um, it was a respected part of the community. And then by the time we hit something like the 1920s, the decline is in and the decline since the 1920s, so the last hundred years, has been significant. What, what do you think's driving that? I mean, I know we touch yeah. on a couple of things along the way, but... Oh yeah, so many things. But firstly, before we get to the, to, to the things themselves, 
we have to realise that we can't separate the Church of England or the Church in England from England. So England has always been a Christian country and people go, no, it was pagan, blah, blah, blah. No, since England was a country, it has been Christian. Mm. Yes, there have been pagans in the British Isles and before England was a country, there were pagans around, but since England has been a country, we've always been Christian. And that's important because the two go hand in hand. It's where we get our law from. Our common law is based on the Ten Commandments. It's where we get our morality from, as in British et etiquette and our way of being. All of it comes from the faith. So the moment you strip out the faith, you strip out the soul of the nation. And so that downward spiral since the like, 1920s hasn't just been the church, hasn't just been attendance, bombs in pews, it's been the country. Like the, the, in our kind of modern era, the 1910s, 1920s was the peak of, of British society. And it's been on a downward spiral ever since. And this is because you can't have one without the other. It's essentially you've knocked out a leg of the stool then. I would say you're taking the heart out. Because we've, we've seen that it's so good. Well, we've had it so good. Our country is so good. Our empire was so good. We thought, well, this is great. So let's take away the things that are challenging. Let's take away those things that we don't necessarily like. Let's take away the hard bits. And of course, we're just left with the goodness. But it doesn't work like that in any, any way, shape or form. You take the soul out. You take the foundation out. It's only a matter of time before the building crumbles. And so by, by removing Christianity from the public square, whether that's our politicians, you know, as we record this, we've got another Lib Dem who's been booted out for being openly Christian. Uh, we've, got, <laughs> we've got Kate Forbes who's been denied First Minister of Scotland for being Christian. So you take it out of politics. You take it out of the public conversation, as in, you ask any Brit on the street, you vox pop them today, say, what religion are you? What faith are you? What do you believe? They'll be shy, embarrassed, or ashamed to say anything, if at all. Or, or maybe they'll be, you know, universalist or some kind of spirituality or spiritualist. Only 10, 20 years ago, everyone would say Church of England, as in I was a Church of England by default. So it's been taken out of the public square, taken out of education. So every single school in this land has an obligation under law to have some form of worship of a distinctly Christian nature. Even secular state schools, every single school, uh, except for the faith schools of other faiths, and they're not doing it. When I was at school, we had the Lord's Prayer, we had uh, C.S. Lewis read an assembly, we had hymns every day, and that's cultural capital as well as faith. It's an important part of who we are. So we're taking it out of politics, out of public square, out of education. We've stripped the faith out of everything and we've left this big void, which as we talk about on every show, every podcast in this building every day pretty much, is being filled with wokeness and Mohammedanism. So we're being attacked on the right, we're being attacked on the left, and it's because we've left this massive void and nature abhors a vacuum. Do you think that was deliberate? To some extent, yes. I mean, we could talk about how far back does it go to the Frankfurt School? Is it, is it all neo-Marxism? And to some extent it is. But I think it's even broader than that. And I look at things from a spiritual perspective. And I think this isn't a cultural war. This is a spiritual war. This is the enemy. This is, this is the devil himself saying, Christendom is a land that has been claimed for Christ. How do I disrupt that? How do we break that down? And so liberals, Marxists, um, Mohammedans, they're all, unwit most of them unwittingly, on the side of Satan, destroying Christendom. Well, it's quite overt. I mean, at the time of filming, we've recently had the Eurovision Song Contest, which was openly satanic in right. places. Um, and it's, it's a common theme in a lot of the music awards. And I just think, well, you know, what are these people rebelling against? They've, they've won everything. Um, yeah. They're rebelling against... <laughs> yes. Well, what do all these things have in common? Look at any of them. Take Black Lives Matter, take uh, the LGBT lobby, um, Think, give me something else that's woke that's come up recently. Take any of them. Yeah. Look at their policies. Look at what they stand for. It's always, always two things crop up. Destroy the patriarchy and smash heteronormativity. And I always ask the question, like, what do black lives mattering have to do with a patriarchy or heteronormativity? Or what does, you know, what does Just Up Oil have to do with that? Any of these woke things. And it's because... It's not just about their policy. It's not just about what they pretend to be about. It's about the greater, the big picture, which is Satan attacking God, which is these guys perhaps unwittingly being on the side of Satan. And when they say smash heteronormativity, they mean break apart the Christian family, the traditional yes. family, the unit of one man, one woman in a lifelong union, which we used to call marriage, um, and having children for the benefit of themselves, for the benefit of the society, and for the, for the greater glory of God. So breaking down heteronormativity and saying, what we used to say was 
alternative lifestyles become the new normative, right? So get rid of the normative, we'll have the alternative, promote that as a good thing. So evil becomes good, good becomes evil, and then we die out as a species because we're not reproducing. So smash heteronormativity and destroy the patriarchy. And they'll say, well, it's because of equality and women need to have equal rights and this and that and the other. And maybe there was an element of that argument that had some uh, truth in it. But of course, all, all lies have an element of truth in it if they want to be successful. Uh, but what actually destroying the patriarchy was about wasn't about removing abusive men from situations so that women could have an equal shot. It wasn't about that at all. We've seen the feminist movement move from wave one through to wave four from wanting equality to wanting superiority to, to again, you vox pop any woman in the streets today and say, do men have a purpose? No. What good are men? Ask them, do women have a purpose? Yes, we can't we live without women. And and in the public conversations, you can be detrimental towards men, but not towards women. That's not a good thing. The sexes used to be complementary to each other. So smash the patriarchy was, on the one hand, destroying the masculinity of men. On the other hand, destroying the idea of fathers, because we live in a fatherless society, which means that every element of our lives is worse, especially crime rates and education. And fundamentally, though, it's not about me, it's not about you, it's not about any man, it's about God. The ultimate patriarch is God our Father. He said, call me Father. He wants a patriarchal relationship with him. How did he reveal himself to us? Well, through the patriarchs. Abraham is a good example. He chose, he called them patriarchs. He chose male leadership for a reason, and that's not sexist, it's not misogynistic, it's because we have differences in our sexes. Again, something we used to know, that we've forgotten, that the sexes are very similar, but have major differences. And so God works through a patriarchal system. So destroy the patriarch means destroy God or destroy our relationship with God. Smash heteronormativity means destroy the Christian family, destroy our, our relationship again with our fathers and our father. All of it is the satanic attack on Christ, but we are just the instruments. Well, I mean, certainly if I, if I was an agent of Satan, I would much rather, you know, get to work on, on uh, you know, a, a, a single mother and misdirected children rather than trying to go after an intact family union. I can imagine that makes it a lot easier. W what is it that Satan actually wants? I mean, what, what's his end goal in all of this? Oh, well, pride was, it was his motivation, but his end goal, I suppose, is just an affront to God. It's just to convince us, to convince mankind that we can become gods of ourselves. And that goes all the way back to Genesis, you know, the serpent whispering in the air of Eve that you can eat of the, fr the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. You can become like God and questioning God himself. Did God really say? It's this idea that we don't need God because St. Lucifer didn't think he needed God and he didn't want to serve what he saw as lesser beings, which is us, because we are made in the image of God. And so God wanted his angels to serve mankind. And, and it's, the story is that Lucifer was not happy with that because of pride he fell. And he wants us to fall because misery, misery likes company. Does the green agenda look to you like a like it is filling a religion shaped hole in people there is a lot of that there is on the extreme end the people who fervently believe in the green agenda whether it's the climate crisis climate emergency or net zero whatever they want to call it they are subscribed to it so fervently that it has become a belief structure in the point that they can't address reason or logic it's almost cultish it's, you know, there's that, uh, there's a mental block there. Uh, but that's just on the extreme end. I think on the, on, the, on, the, on the mass, people just want to be seen as nice people. And that goes for every single woke ideology. That's how they always get in, by encouraging people to virtue signal. And it's no different with the Greens. It's, they just say, look, to be a nice person, you have to recycle. You've got to buy all these expensive new boilers or solar panels or whatever it is. You've got to pay extra taxes and it's all good for the environment. Of course, somehow paying more money cuts carbon emissions, which of course is a lie. And we know it's, it's the elite and it's their power dynamic that it's a form of control, but also a form of making a lot of money out of us. Yes. Uh, well, I know they don't go after private jets. Funny that, isn't it? Yes. But I mean, it's all, it's all a big nonsense, of course. The climate does change and a lot of it's founded on false principles. I've, you know, I'm sure you've seen many of the same documentaries of, that I have of, of the way that they do carbon dating is, is flawed. The way that they check the, uh, when, when they dig deep and check the oxygen levels in ice, uh, when they've looked further into that, they've realized that actually the science is the opposite way around in that the temperature and the CO2 emissions are the cause and correlation of Oh yes, it, it, it follows not leads. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, 
So all of the science is illogical, it's, it's flawed. Supports the power structure. So that's where we've got to today. But let's see if we can try and trace through that, that dramatic fall in church attendance from the early 1900s to, to where we are today. Um, there's, there's a number of milestones on that. Perhaps the first one to pick on would be the, um, was it the 1936 um, King Edward abdication? What, why was that a significant moment? That was important because that was, I would say that was a good thing, because at that point we still had a chance to cling on to our moral compass. We still had an idea of what was right and what's wrong. And so our monarchy is held to a higher standard because they are supposed to set the standard. So the monarchy is a physical living embodiment of Britain, or has been, uh, much like the Americans have their flag that they all use as a symbol of unity. We have our monarchy, and so we expect them to live um, at least publicly a high, to a higher degree. Um, and of course, it's unchristian, it's not proper for a king to marry a divorcee, a, a person who has a husband or a wife already. Because, because King Edward became infatuated with an American actress. It wasn't Meghan Merkel, who was it? it Wallace was a, Simpson. That's the one. Um, at, but she was a divorcee, so in order to go ahead and marry her, I mean, he, he, at least he didn't go down the Henry VIII route of, of dissolving the church in order to get it, but he, he did abdicate. And at that time, um, you know, there was, there was fierce opposition from, it, from the church, but the line basically held at that point. Yeah, because he had a choice of either marry this divorcee American actress or be king. And he said, I want my bread and eat, my bread and eat it, what's that? my cake and eat it. He said, I want my cake and eat it, I want both. And the British public said no, but more importantly, the church said no. They said, we won't marry you. We can't do that. Right, it actually held the line. Yeah, so Cosmo Lang, who was the Archbishop of the, at the time, essentially kind of emotionally blackmailed the king. And, and I believe that some of the bishops leaked these, these truths to the press, Yes. Uh, that this was a grave scandal and that the church couldn't have it. And this would have been the case for King Charles III as well. The same story as... Because they did the not hold the line then. No, because things had shifted by then. Culturally, things had changed in that short span of time. And that's because the church's teaching on marriage and divorce changed. The next significant change, and I think we, we must come back to the divorce, but to keep it vaguely chronological, the, 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 another big thing that you pointed out to me as being a really significant shift would have been the 1960s and the introduction of the pill. Yeah. Now, the... Um, the, the church was significantly opposed to this, as I understand, yep. but a lot of the populace, who were still largely church-going at the time, um, were more accepting of this. And this was a fundamental change to society. Why was that so fun? Why was it so significant for the church? So in 1908 and 1920, the church said contraception is not allowed. And the, the, the big C church has always said contraception is not allowed. And then in 1930, they made some exemptions. And once you make some exemptions, that's it. You're on the slippery slope until, to full acceptance. And then in 1958, the Church of England said, well, they passed the buck. They said, well, it depends on the conscience of the parents. But the language is important, recognising that they are parents and, and contraception is, is blocking that. But the reason it's so important is because contraception essentially removes God from the situation. So the sexual act, the, the whole purpose of the sexual act is to be between a married man and a married woman for the purpose of reproduction, for the, the good of the family, to grow a family, which is for the greater glory of God, so that there are more people to worship God, but it's also an avoidance of sin. It's the only way you can have uh, sexual acts without it being fornication. To happen within marriage so of course contraception says actually what you can do here is you can separate god from the situation whether you're married or not you can engage in sexual intercourse for the pleasure for the desire thus making it purely sin so it's separating ah. the the opportunity of being blessed with children by god it's taking that entirely out of it so whether you're married or not contraception is a sin and so the church has always taught this and so in 1958, the Church of England said, well, actually, we'll leave it up to the conscience of the parents, rather than being firm and saying, no, the church teaches that contraception is a sin. The Roman Catholics held the line. Do you know if, I don't, I don't know this, I don't know whether, um, 
I mean, I presume so, that Catholic church attendance was not impacted as heavily, or at least predominantly Catholic countries were not affected as heavily in the decline during this period. Do you know if that's the case? No, so well, in this country at least, it's the same decline. So okay. it used to be that both Anglicans and Roman Catholics had attendance in the millions in the 1980s, and now combining both those numbers, you struggle to get a million. Right. So the attendance has gone down in Christianity in general in Britain. Okay. But there's, there's something about the church saying, well, we are going to abdicate our um, moral leadership role here. Yeah. And that's, that's where we looked for our moral leadership, the church. I mean, in this country, it was mostly the Church of England because it is the established church of this realm. But the big C church is where we looked. And so when the church stepped aside, and in, in, in terms of the Roman Catholic Church, it cannot change its teaching. It did not change its teaching, but it stopped teaching. It stopped being loud about these things from the 1960s onwards, pretty much. Stopped loudly uh, promoting Christian doctrine. And the Church of England altered ah. its teaching on many things, such as what we heard on contraception, such as on divorce. Uh, we mentioned King Edward VIII's abdication, but it was in 2002, I believe, that the Church of England declared that you can now marry a divorcee who has their partner still with, alive. And that was significant for two reasons. One is because in 2005, so mere years later, King Charles, uh, pri uh, who was Prince Charles at the time, married Camilla Parker Bowles. So you could suggest that this was pushed through in order so that he could marry who wa he wanted to marry and kings wanted to marry who they wanted to marry. It affects a lot of things in this country. But the second re and most important reason it, it's significant is because marriage in the Christian faith is indissoluble. So it's not just a contract, whether social or legal. It's not just uh, about love or desire or wants or likes or attraction. It's about a union, a permanent, lifelong union between one man and one woman, and always has been. For the purpose of children? Right. Hmm. I mean, it doesn't, for this part of the conversation, it doesn't matter what the purpose is. It's just the point that it's indissoluble. Right. So that means that even if you get divorced, under the eyes of God, that person, if they're still alive, they are still your husband or still your wife. Therefore, you can't, to remarry is polygamy, is sin. Right. So I'm, I'm sympathetic to um, remarriage in the event of widowing. Right. W was, was that a that's, different thing? That's different. So if, if someone dies, yes. then you can remarry. Okay. And was that the case prior to... Yes. That's always been Christian teaching. Because um, there's, the, the, you know, there's the parable about what if I marry my brother's... Uh, widow and his widow and his widow and his widow that's that story and then Christ says well in heaven there are no husbands and wives because our relationships are different in heaven but uh, so this and this is part of the problem with King Henry VIII as well um, so yes you've always been able to marry if you are widowed or a widower but if your husband or wife is still alive you cannot get remarried unless that first marriage is annulled as in cancelled out and so divorce is permissible but not promoted. Divorce is not a good thing. It's, you can get a divorce, for example, in this situation of abuse or somewhere we something where you need to. But also in this country, we've promoted no fault of uh, divorce. Yeah. So it's the idea that you can, well, I'm done with you. I'm bored of you now. I want to go on to something else. It undermines the whole purpose of marriage being indissoluble. Uh, but they, the Church of England left it up to individual priests, which is horrible because it means that as a priest, you can't say, well, I'm sorry, I can't do that because the church teaches. It becomes about you. So they say, well, you're a bigot. I'll go to a priest who will allow me to remarry. And that's the same with same-sex unions, and same with all this kind of stuff. Women priests, whenever the church waters something down, it, it, it doesn't have the authority anymore. And it kind of makes yes. a target of the priests. To watch the full video, please become a premium member at lotuseaters.com.